this week when we read chapters five to eight. So let's look at the questions. One, what do you think is the key factor that seals the rental deal that guarantees the success? Why? Question two, how would you describe Henrietta and Louisa Musgrove? What do you think being modern might mean? Question three, how would you describe that society's understanding of children? Is it different from ours? If so, how? Question four, the novel says that Anne's power with Captain Wentworth was gone forever. So she no longer has power over Wentworth. Do you think this might be true? Why or why not? Question five, how would you describe that society's understanding of naval warfare? Is it different from our understanding? If so, how? Let's take a look at question one. Chapter five, this is page 22. Here. This meeting of the two parties proved highly satisfactory and decided the whole business at once. So the two parties are, of course, uh, renter and rentee. Uh, so on the one hand, Sir Walter is leasing out Kellynch Hall. On the other hand, Admiral Croft and his wife are trying to rent it. These are the two parties, Liang Feng. Prove here means turn out to be. Turn out highly satisfactory and decided the whole business at once. Each lady was previously well disposed for an agreement. So they were already wanting an agreement and saw nothing, therefore, but good manners in the other. Uh, each the other, so one lady to the other, the other lady to the first lady. And with regard to the gentleman, there was such a hearty good humor, such an open trusting liberality on the Admiral's side as could not but influence Sir Walter. So a hearty good humor, pi qi hen hao. Uh, notice this is the British grammar uh, in British English. Every or I guess in the past today it might be different, but in traditional uh, British English grammar, every word that begins with an H is considered a vowel. So uh, the A before this has to be turned into an N. Uh, today, even in American English, there are some people who still follow this rule. But of course, today the contemporary correct rule is depending on the sound of the word. If you can hear the H at the beginning of the word, then it's a consonant. If you cannot hear the H, then it's a vowel. So words that you cannot hear the H, for example, include herb, yao cao. H E R B. So you would say an herb. Um, good humor, open, trusting liberality. To be liberal, we talked about this last time, is to be open and free and trusting. So basically, these three words basically mean the same thing. Uh, so the Admiral is very open and trusting. Um, both sides were, had a good humor, uh, and therefore, but this had an influence on Sir Walter. Right, he's such a good guy. Uh, I guess I could um, rent out my house to him, no matter like even though I don't want to rent it out to a sailor or to anyone, basically. But if he had to rent it out to anyone, this would be a good person. 
who had besides been flattered into his very best and most polished behavior by Mr. Shepard's assurances as of his being known by report to the Admiral as a model of good breeding. So before the meeting, Mr. Shepard, his lawyer, his agent, had already been flattering him, that uh, And so he is now on his best and most polished behavior. Even today in English, we have this phrase, to be on your best behavior, which means to behave in the best and most polite way. Polished here means shoshida. Uh, we usually say you polish something like just polish your glasses, polish uh, a metal door knob, uh, something like that. Uh, but to a person, it means that their behavior is very polite. So how did Mr. Shepard flatter Sir Walter? By assuring him that he is known by report, by reputation, to the Admiral as a model of good breeding. Yang Yu Jiao Yang Hen Hao. To breed means to raise, to to uh, mate and raise animals. This is Dong Wu the Pei Zhong Yang Yu. But in the beginning, it also referred to the raising and education of humans. So. Mr. Shepard kept saying to Sir Walter that the Admiral knows by reputation that you are a model of good uh, education and person. And in this way, Sir Walter was more inclined to accept this deal. The house and grounds, uh, the grounds is the land around the house and furniture were approved. Furniture, of course, is jaju. The crops were approved. Uh, so uh, this is on both sides, right? Were the house grounds and furniture were approved by the crops, and the crops were approved by Sir Walter. Terms, Taojian, time, everything and everybody was right. I guess we could say Tian Su and Mr. Shepherd's clerks had a Wenshu Gong Tada Wenshu Naga Wenshu Ren Chuli Ren were set to work without there having been a single preliminary difference to modify of all that this indenture showeth. This last part means that they didn't even need to change any part of the contract. This indenture showeth is a traditional beginning to a contract in those days. Indenture means owing service for money. Uh, so indenture here would be the agreement for service. Showeth, uh, we said last time that this is the older spelling of show, uh, ETH is the older form of S. So in modern English, this these three words would be this contract shows. Uh, so not even a preliminary difference, so not even in the opening parts, the unimportant parts uh, of the contract, nothing was changed. Sir Walter, without hesitation, declared the Admiral to be the best looking sailor he had ever met with. Remember last time we talked about appearances. Being handsome. And went so far as to say that if his own man might have had the arranging of his hair, he should not be ashamed of being seen with him anywhere. OK, so the point is he should not he would not be ashamed of being seen with the Admiral anywhere. Such a good looking sailor with one exception. If here means as long as. As long as Sir Walter's own man could arrange the Admiral's hair. So the one thing that Sir Walter doesn't like about Admiral Croft is his hair. 
and the admiral with sympathetic cordiality. Sympathetic, tongqing de. Cordiality means politeness. Uh, observed to his wife as they drove back through the park. The park is the name for the land immediately around Kellynch Hall. This is the land that Sir Walter is free to use uh, for his own entertainment. And when they drive, of course, they're driving a horse and carriage, horse drawn carriage. Matsu. He said to his wife, I thought we should soon come to a deal, my dear, in spite of what they told us at Taunton. Remember, Mr. Shepherd told them at Taunton that Sir Walter did not want it to be known that he is leasing out his property, did not want any advertisement, doesn't want anybody to know this must be secret. Uh, so the Admiral said, I thought we would come to a deal quickly, despite what they told us about Sir Walter wanting this to be a secret. The Baronet, Sir Walter, will never set the Thames on fire, but there seems no harm in him. So again, uh, Sir Walter seems harmless, but there's another condition. He will never set the Thames on fire. Uh, on the surface, the Thames is Tai Wu Sihe, but it's not talking about actual fire. Thames here is uh, standing in for London. He will never set London on fire. And London here means London society, high society. Uh, so, which means the baronets will never be very popular in high society of London. So, like, he's not the best kind of, he doesn't have the best manners, doesn't have the best connections, isn't the best kind of person, but at least he's harmless. So, they each think that the other person is not perfect, but acceptable. And the novel says that these are reciprocal compliments. Which would have been esteemed about equal. Uh, to be esteemed means to be valued, to be evaluated as. Uh, so the novel tells us they each think uh, they each have about the same height of opinion about each other. Uh, the Crofts were to have possession at Michaelmas, uh, and the footnote tells us that Michaelmas is a holiday on September 29. So the deal has finished, has been completed. The question is, what is the key factor? Well, um, the key obstacle to this deal is, of course, Sir Walter. He doesn't like the idea of renting out his place. So as long as we can get Sir Walter to agree to the deal, the deal is probably going to succeed. So what is the key factor in getting Sir Walter to agree to the deal? Well, there are two parts, right? What kind of person will get to use his house? And what would the other person think of him, himself, Sir Walter? The first point, Admiral Croft is, according to Sir Walter, the best looking sailor he had ever met. Uh, on the other hand, Mr. Shepard kept assuring Sir Walter that the Admiral only had the highest opinion of him. But if we have to choose one key factor between these two, last week we noted how Sir Walter judges appearances by status. So he, when he says that Admiral Croft is the best looking sailor he's ever met, he's not just talking about the physical appearance, he's also talking about Sir Walt, uh, Admiral Croft's status, social status and his um, behavior, how polite and fitting his behavior is. 
And because we know Sir Walter is such a self-centered person, whatever status he sees in Admiral Croft is a reflection of his own status. In other words, the reason he thinks Sir Walter, the reason Sir Walter thinks Admiral Croft is the best looking sailor is because Mr. Shepard has already told him that Admiral Croft has a very high opinion of him. He's good looking because he's has correct behavior and his correct behavior is to hold Sir Walter in high esteem. So really the one key factor to this deal is that Mr. Shepard kept flattering Sir Walter before the Admiral arrived, put him in a good mood, and when he's in a good mood about himself and his situation, everything he sees is a, is like good for him. Okay, do you have questions about the first one? Okay, before we move on to question two, I want to point out one point of grammar. Uh, here, he should not be ashamed. And then here, I thought we should soon. The word should here does not mean ought to, ingai. The word should here is simply would. In traditional British English grammar and traditional American English grammar, uh, the word would and will is used for the second person and the third person, dearens and desirensen. But for the first person, dearensen, the would and will should be changed to should and shall. And the reason is, uh, the reason comes from the origin of these two words. Uh, the word will as a noun, even today, means intention. The word shall in the old days meant command. So if uh, you use the word will for the first person, it is not a simple future tense. It also carries the meaning of intention. So if you say I will do something, you are expressing your strong determination to do this thing. On the other hand, if uh, you say you shall or they shall. Uh, the meaning is not just future tense. It's also expressing the idea that the speaker, the person talking, is kind of commanding you or them to do something. So in order to avoid these extra meanings, uh, the in English we used to flip these two. So if you say I shall, there is no determination. There is no command. It's a simple uh, future tense. And if you say you will or they will, there is no command. There's no uh, determination. It's a simple future tense. Today, of course, we don't use the word shall. Um, and the word should simply means we ought to do something. It would be best to, to do something. But when we're reading something like Jane Austen, it would be useful to remember that these two words are actually have the same meaning, just attached to two different kinds of subject. OK, question two. How would you describe these two young women? Page 28. 28. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. So in this part, we're introduced to the Musgrove family. Mr. and Mrs. Musgrove were a very good sort of people, a good kind of people, friendly and hospitable, Halke. Not much educated and not at all elegant. Uh, so according to Jane Austen, these are the best kind of people, friendly, open to visitors and guests, 
and the education and the like elegance refine, refinement not as important. Their children had more modern minds and manners. There was a numerous family, but the only two grown up excepting Charles, which means except for Charles, were Henrietta and Louisa. Young ladies of 19 and 20, so Louisa is older. Who had brought from a school at Exeter all the usual stock of accomplishments. Um, so they went to school at Exeter. Exeter today is a prep school, which means that the students who are accepted into Exeter usually go on to Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, so usually they are the children of the rich and famous. And they came home from school with the usual accomplishments. Uh, which means the accomplishments that are expected of a good student. So even though it says the usual, what it really means is uh, all or most of the accomplishments. To be expected of a good student. And we're now like thousands of other young ladies living to be fashionable, happy and merry. OK, these three words fashionable. Yes, it applies to clothing, but it also applies to manners and behavior. What are the most recent trendy kinds of uh, behavior? What is considered the latest kind of etiquette? Li Jie? Mary today simply means happy. But uh, in Jane Austen's time, these two words had different meanings. Happy applies to your own feeling. You feel happy or not. Mary is a kind of attitude or behavior that affects other people. So if you're merry, you make other people happy. Their dress, so their clothing, had every advantage. Uh, and this means that it makes them look very good. Uh, because it's like some people, even when they wear the be so called best or like uh, most fashionable clothing, it doesn't necessarily make them look good. You have to wear the clothing that fits you. Uh, so they know how to make themselves look good by the clothing that they wear. Their faces were rather pretty. Their spirits or attitude and energy extremely good. Their manners unembarrassed and pleasant. So their behavior, their etiquette. Uh, why would manners be embarrassed? Uh, usually uh, this could be used to describe the manners of a person who is not used to using this kind of manner or who perhaps feels that they themselves are inferior in society, like they are lower than other people or who constantly think about who is higher, who is lower. But these two young ladies don't. They simply behave in the way that they think is best and most fashionable, so they aren't embarrassed by any of the surrounding ideas of status. And the manners are pleasant. Uh, I think in this novel, these two ideas are linked together. Their manners are pleasant because they are unembarrassed. Uh, if someone's manners are embarrassed, you might feel embarrassed for them. It might make you embarrassed or awkward, not pleasant. So these two go together. They were of consequence at home and favorites abroad. We said last time consequence means importance. So their place in the family is important. People listen to them. Their family members listen to them. Abroad here simply means outside the home. So when they go out into society, people also like them. 
Anne always contemplated them as some of the happiest creatures of her acquaintance. Contemplate here simply just means uh, think of. She thinks of them as very happy people. Of her acquaintance, of the people that she is acquainted with, of the people that she knows, these two young ladies are the happiest. Now, a creature is not an animal. A creature is any. OK, I guess a creature is an animal. Uh, humans are also animals. Uh, but the idea is that creatures are those uh, animals that were created by God. You see the common link create creature created. So this refers to anything that it, that is not. But usually it refers to animals. We don't they don't usually call plants creatures. Uh, but it also does not refer to anything that is made by humans. So usually it just refers to people and animals. And there's a religious idea, right? Happy. Uh, not separated from the idea of religious faith. So the question, how would you describe these two young women? Uh, I would say young and happy, energetic. Uh, and yet they were also polite and they knew the correct or acceptable behavior in society. They're popular, well loved. Um, and the second part of this question, what do you think it means that they are modern? Uh, let's see, where was it? They had more modern minds and manners. I think it's the 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 most um, evident comparison is here. The unembarrassed and pleasant manners. So if you compare them to like Sir Walter, who is from an older generation, I would even say two generations older because Anne is already 27. He's always thinking about status, who is higher, who is lower. All of his behavior is revolving around the question of status. So I guess the modern idea is to care less about status and more about uh, like enjoying life and being fashionable and making other people happy also. Uh, appears to be the modern idea. Okay, do you have questions about question two? Okay, let's move on to question three. Understanding of children. Well, we already met, or I guess we already mentioned some children last time. If you remember when we were first introduced to Mrs. Clay, she returned from an unprosperous marriage with the burden of two children. So children are considered a burden, Fultan. Um, but in the Musgrove house, Charles and Mary also have children, so we can uh, look at how they think of their children. And because again, we have the advantage of using a PDF, we can simply search the word children. The management of their children. Uh, this is uh, Charles talking to Anne. I could manage them well if it were not for Mary's interference. But then Mary tells Anne, Charles spoils the children so that I cannot get them into any order. Uh, spoil here is Tsong uh, Huai. So when they talk about their children, it's always about management and order. Um, 
but there's also another person who talks about the management of children, and that is Mrs. Musgrove. This is Charles's mother. And she says to Anne, uh, in general, the children are so spoilt, which means spoiled, gorgeous, past tense. Um, they are as fine, healthy children as ever were seen without partiality. So objectively speaking, they're good children. But Mrs. Charles, so Mary, knows no more how they should be treated. Uh, so they're good children, but because Mary doesn't know how to take care of them, they are troublesome sometimes create trouble. So it looks like in this society, they don't really care too much about uh, the inner state or the development or the like the education of children. They care more about keeping children in line, in order. Right, uh, Mrs. Musgrove continues. You know it is very bad to have children with one, which means it's not a good idea to take children around to go around with you. One is obliged, one has to be checking every moment. Don't do this and don't do that. Or that one can only keep in tolerable order by more cake than is good for them. So how does Mrs. Musgrove manage the children? She keeps on feeding them cake because when they're eating cake, they can't do anything else. Yeah, so they only really care about managing children. There's also an earlier passage. See if I can find this. Um, I think it's I think it was in last week's reading. So this is Mrs. Clay, right? With the additional burden of two children. Um, there, here we go from last week's reading. Mr. Shepherd says that Furniture is in danger of suffering where there is no lady as where there were many children. So children are also seen as the source of destroying furniture. Maybe not destroying like 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 breaking apart and things like that, but like where there are children, the furniture suffer. And if you've ever seen little kids running around the house, you will know exactly what this means. So again, another example of looking at children as a burden, as a trouble, um, as something to be taken care of. This is also good. Uh, where am I? This is on page 25. This is from this week. Uh, Anne goes to Uppercross to stay with the Musgroves. Uh, and she's now looking at Mary's drawing room coating. The once elegant furniture of which had been gradually growing shabby. Uh, under the influence of four summers and two children. Uh, Mary and Charles live in a part of Uppercross called Uppercross Cottage, Xiao Wu. Uh, the novel explains that this was recently added. So they've only been there four years. Uh, so time makes a living room look worse, but also children makes the living room look worse. Same idea, children destroying furniture. It's no wonder we never see a cat in this novel. Uh, yes, and so that is very different from how we view children today. This change uh, occurred 
later in the 19th century uh, during the Industrial Revolution, Gongye um, At the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, uh, everybody had to work in a factory or in a coal mine to make money. Uh, the Industrial Revolution had both a push and a pull. The pull, of course, was work and money. The push was that previously, uh, people who were farmers not only worked their own land, they also worked common land. But at the uh, during the 18th and 19th centuries, the law was changed and landowners started encircling their land with walls and punishing people who stepped onto private land or used any resources on those lands. So previously, if the land was not surrounded, if it was considered common land, uh, you could farm there, you could hunt there, you can fish there. But with the so-called enclosure movement, where people started enclosing this land, closing it up, and this includes royal land, land that belongs to the King of England. There was less and less land to farm, less and less sources of food. And so with uh, decreasing income and decreasing sources of food, people who used to be farmers were now forced to find work in cities. And at that time, the work in cities was factories and mines. Um, and you know the big bosses of these factories and and these mines tried to pay as little money as they can right they tried to make money from their business so they basically paid just enough money for families not to starve to death because if they starve to death they can't work for them um and so in order to make enough money to live entire families had to go work in, in the factory and in the mine, including women, including children. They worked in factories for 12, 15, 18 hours at a time with maybe one or two breaks in the middle. It was a terrible, terrible time to be a worker. Um, and, you know, most people who were not capitalists who were not owners of these factories and mines thought that this was a terrible situation, especially for the children, because children are supposed to uh, be healthy enough to grow up into adults. They're not supposed to die of uh, pneumonia ultra microscopic silico volcanoconiosis, which is the name for coal miners lung disease. They were not supposed to die from overwork. So at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the romantic poets, people like Blake, Wordsworth, Coleridge, Shelley, that uh, you read about in English literature class, wrote poems also about children. Blake wrote poems about how children were suffering in the cities. Wordsworth wrote about how uh, adults should learn inspiration and imagination from children. He famously said, the child is father of the man. Um, and it was from that point that people's ideas about children started to change. Not only was it important to make them behave and keep them healthy, they were also granted value. Childhood itself was also granted value. No longer was childhood considered something like uh, slavery. You could only listen to adults and do what you're told. Now people started to care about what children thought, how they felt, uh, how they uh, participated in the family and in society as well. Um, so, you know, if you 
ever have the chance to read even older literature that has children in it, don't be surprised if the children are basically treated like the servants, because that's how people used to think of children as slaves that would later grow up to be people. OK, do you have questions about this one? All right, let's look at question four. Our first serious question about the relationship between Anne and Captain Wentworth. Um, so after Anne arrives at Upper Cross Cottage, uh, the Musgroves are invited to go out, I think hunting uh, with Captain Wentworth. Uh, and then after they come back, Mary starts talking to Anne. Uh, and then Mary, you know, she's a very chatty, gossipy woman who also cares a lot about status. She comes from the Elliot family. But in their conversation, suddenly Mary says, Captain Wentworth, I'm on page 41. Captain Wentworth is not very gallant by you, Anne. Gallant means chivalrous, qi shi jing sen. In other words, the proper way for a man to behave toward a woman. And Mary says he was not very gallant by you, Anne, though he was so attentive to me. Henrietta asked him what he thought of you when they went away, and he said, you were so altered, he should not have known you again. So altered means changed. So in contemporary English, this sentence means that Anne had changed so much since he had last seen her that he wouldn't have recognized her if nobody had told him this was Anne. Now, this scene is very interesting because there are three different perspectives to consider. First is Mary. Why is she telling Anne this? The key line is here. He was so attentive to me. Mary cares about status, cares about um, vanity, being treated properly. So here she's kind of gloating. She's kind of showing off. Uh, saying that, oh, Captain Winters was, was so good to me. And the only way that she could mention this without uh, simply saying he was very good to me, uh, which would be impolite, is to sneak this information into the conversation. And she does this by mentioning something that is related in which uh, Anne would properly be, con be uh, concerned about. The idea is you can't when you're talking to somebody, you can't just say whatever you want. The conversation should be something that the other person is interested in or should be interested in. So uh, Mary can't just say Wentworth was so good to me. That has nothing to do with Anne. She has to sneak this information in uh, because as it is related to the idea that Wentworth did not behave as well to Anne. This is something that Anne would be concerned about. Uh, the second perspective is Anne, of course. We're going to talk about that later on this page. Uh, the third perspective is Wentworth. Um, and we can already think about this now because this is the only evidence we will have from his perspective, this line. Let's think about this. He behaves very well to Mary. He behaves very well to Henrietta and everybody else who goes out hunting with him. The only person who he does not compliment. Is Anne. This line is not exactly negative, but it's definitely not positive. So when. Uh, 
you see this comparison. Anne is the only person he treats differently. Is it true that Wentworth, uh, Anne no longer has power with Wentworth, that Wentworth no longer cares about Anne? I think it's the exact opposite. He behaves differently only with Anne because Anne is the only person that he really cares about. That's not what Anne thinks, so we can look at the evidence for Anne's perspective. Um, but, but I also want you to pay attention to this quote. This is put in quotation marks. But it doesn't say I, it says he. If you remember before we began reading the book, before we began watching the movie, I warned you that Jane Austen sometimes does this. She mixes up direct quotation and indirect quotation. She will use both at the same time sometimes. And this is because direct quotation was a new thing. Authors at that time were not very sure how to use it. Most novels before then, or most novels throughout the history of the English novel were epistolary, shu xingti. So whoever was speaking, there's only one perspective, the person writing the letter. But with direct quotation, you are actually uh, using a perspective within a perspective. You are asking one person to say something as if they were another person. Right here, this long quotation is Mary. Mary is talking, but here Mary has to say something from Wentworth's perspective. This was a new invention in the novel, so authors were not exactly sure how to handle this yet. And that's why it's kind of confused, but the way, but the examples where Austin gets it right, where she does not mix up direct and indirect quotation, served as a good example for later novelists uh, in the English language uh, so that this quickly developed into its proper form and separated direct and indirect. Uh, OK, so Mary says Wentworth said this. Mary had no feelings to make her respect her sisters in a common way which means Mary's feelings and Anne's feelings were very different. The logic of how they felt was very different. It was not common. In common. Uh, so she does not understand her sister's logic of emotion. Therefore, she was perfectly uh, unsuspicious of being inflicting any peculiar wound. Which means Mary had no idea that telling Anne this would hurt her feelings. Because they think about these kinds of things very differently. To be suspicious of something to means to to think that something may be true. To inflict a wound means to cause a wound. Uh, peculiar means special, here meaning uh, specific and strong. Let's pause here and take a 10 minute break. So Wentworth has said you were so altered you he should not have known you again. Mary doesn't know what effect this this has on Anne. But this is Anne's reaction. Altered beyond his knowledge. Right? So he doesn't he wouldn't have known her. Anne fully submitted in silent deep mortification. So she didn't try to fight it. She accepted it. But she accepted it 
in mortification. Today in Chinese, we would translate this as ji du ganga. But here it means like dying inside. Uh, mort is the root of the word for death. So for instance, in English, we have the word mortal, which means someone who will die. Doubtless it was so, so she doesn't doubt it. I mean, it must be true. And she could take no revenge, for he was not altered or not for the worse. Ah, so she's saying that he looks at least as good as he used to look. So this sentence means that maybe she thinks that Wentworth looks even better now than he did seven years ago. She had already acknowledged it to herself, and she could not think differently. Uh, so she already acknowledged that he had changed less than she had. And, and now it was too late to change her mind about this. So she could only let him think of her as he would. Uh, she wouldn't would not try to change his mind either. No, the years which had destroyed her youth and bloom had only given him a more glowing, manly, open look. In no respect, lessening his personal advantages. So in no respect here means way in no way uh, reducing his personal advantages. Personal here doesn't mean private. Personal means related to the person. Specifically related to the physical person. So the fact that he now looks more glowing, manly and open only makes his person, his body physically look better. She had seen the same Frederick Wentworth. He did not look like another person. So altered that he should not have known her again. These were words which could not but dwell with her. So she could not stop thinking about this. These words dwell means live, could not but live with her, live inside her. She can't get rid of it. Yet she soon began to rejoice that she had heard them. To rejoice means to to be happy about something. They were of sobering tendency. They sobered her. They made her think about things more clearly. Today we usually use the word sober to mean not drunk. But what it really means is thinking clearly and behaving clearly and seriously. So hearing this made her more clear about the situation. They allayed agitation. Allay means alleviate, reduce, weaken, soften. Agitation here means anxiety. They composed and consequently must make her happier. Composed here means to make her more composed, make her more organized, make her more in charge of herself, in control of herself. And because of this, they made her happier. So they made her happy not by its direct meaning, but by its indirect effects. For, and then we get a paragraph of her analysis. Frederick Wentworth had used such words or something like them, but without an idea that they would be carried round to her. He didn't know that he would hear uh, that she would hear these words. He had thought her wretchedly altered. Notice. He did not use the word wretchedly. He simply said you were so altered. Or I guess this should be she was so altered. Wretchedly is something that Anne adds herself, and this means for the worse, altered for the worse. And in the first moment of appeal, 
had spoken as he felt. So a moment of appeal does not mean sensu. Appeal is when Henrietta asked him what he thought. She appealed to him. Uh, simply meaning she asked him. So as soon as Henrietta asked him, this is what he said. It was exactly as he felt. He had not, not forgiven Anne Elliot. She had used him ill, so treated him poorly. We talked about this last week. Deserted, which means abandoned, and disappointed him. And worse, she had shown a feebleness of character in doing so. Feeble is the opposite of strong. So it was a soft character, wavering, undetermined, weak. Character, of course, means uh, personality. In doing this, which his own character decided, uh, which is, I'm uh, sorry, which his own decided confident temper could not endure. So when she treated him so poorly, because Wentworth, his temperament, his personality was so determined and so confident, he could not endure being treated like this. She had given him up to oblige others, so because others had asked her to do this. It had been the effect of over persuasion. It had been weakness and timidity. Timidity is cowardice. Uh, Dan Xiao. Um, so there's that word again, persuasion, over persuasion. This will be one of the focuses of the final exam. He had been most warmly attached to her and had never seen a woman since, since that time, whom he thought her equal. But except from some natural sensation of curiosity, he had no desire of meeting her again. So the only reason that he may have had to meet her again is out of curiosity to see how she had changed. Her power with him was gone forever. It was now his object to marry, his purpose, his goal, to find a woman to marry. Uh, he had a heart for either of the Miss Musgroves, either Henrietta or Louisa. So uh, for any pleasing young woman who came in his way, excepting Anne Elliot. Uh, so Anne is still thinking that he would marry, he would marry basically possibly any young woman except for Anne herself. Uh, but as we talked about before the break, um, I think because he treats Anne differently from everybody else, this precisely shows her power with him, that he still cares about her. So I think Anne is mistaken in this case. OK, do you have questions about number three? Four, number four. OK, let's move to question five. How would you describe naval warfare? Let's skip ahead. This is on page 43. Uh, Admiral Croft and his wife come to Upper Cross for dinner. Uh, Wentworth is also here. And so Wentworth, uh, the Miss Musgroves, Henrietta and Louisa, ask Wentworth about his naval career. And so here he's talking about uh, what he did in the Navy. He talks about his first ship, the Asp. Uh, And then uh, the Asp was such a, an old ship that he wore it out and it broke up. And then he was sent to the West Indies, Xi Indu Trindal. Today, this is the Caribbean, uh, Florida, uh, that area. 
加勒比海区。It's called the West Indies because when Columbus, 哥伦布 sailed to the west, he was trying to reach India, and when he landed there, he thought he had arrived. Uh, then the Admiralty. The Admiralty is the the control and command center of the Navy. The the people in charge of the Navy. Uh, then gave him his next ship. Uh, let's see, where is it? Uh, oh, not yet. No, here he's still talking about what he did on the ASP before the ASP sunk. He says, I'm on the next page, 40, 44. She was a dear old ASP to me. She did all that I wanted. I knew she would. I knew that we should either go to the bottom together, the bottom of the sea, or that she would be the making of me. She would make my success. Uh, to make it is something we still say today, right? She made it. She succeeded. Uh, but it also used to mean to make a person, to make someone have value and worth in society and also success. I never had two days of foul weather or bad weather all the time I was at sea in her. Today we would say on her, on the ASP. And after taking privateers enough to be very entertaining, I had the good luck in my passage home the next autumn to fall in with the very French frigate I wanted. So there are two things happening in this sentence. He took privateers enough to be entertaining. Privateers are private ships that don't belong to the Navy, but they are authorized to attack the enemy. And so if uh, Wentworth encounters French privateers. They would attack him. He would attack them. And to take privateers means to capture their ship. The goal in naval warfare at that time was not to sink the other person's ship. It was to capture their ship. Because if you could capture their ship, you could take whatever was on board. Uh, and that's how naval soldiers made money and made their careers. So he took enough privateers to be very entertaining. It was a good time, but like not serious. He then had the good luck. Going home the next autumn to fall in with, which means to meet and fight. A French frigate, Chu Zhu Jin. In fact, the very frigate, the same frigate that he was looking for. So apparently he had a mission and the mission was to look for this French ship and to fight them. And he did. He fell in with them, which means he fought them. And I brought her the, the ship. Ships are always female. I brought her into Plymouth, England. And here was another instance of luck. So looks like he won the fight. He captured the frigate and he brought them into England uh, sold the items, made money, took money, also sold the prisoners of war. Uh, in those days, the idea of prisoners of war was still the traditional idea, which is that you can sell these enemy soldiers back to their country. So that's another way to make money. That's why he calls it good luck. Then he says that if he had stayed at sea for another day, the, the ship would have been caught in a storm and he would have sunk. So from this picture of naval warfare, there there's quite a lot of difference from how we think about naval warfare today. Today, we don't really think about fighting on the sea as an action itself. We think about it as part of a larger war. 
Uh, the C is the best means of access to a land for large amounts of equipment and people. So if you want to attack another country from the sea, you have to control the water, and that is the main purpose of naval warfare, to control an area of water. Um, and so by holding control, that means you would have to expel and defeat all enemy ships. So today it doesn't really matter if you sink someone or if you capture someone as long as you have control. And because capturing is more dangerous, it involves hand to hand fighting. Like you have to board the other person's ship and fight them until they surrender. Uh, so today, usually we just sink the enemy ships. Um, and today we don't think about making money from fighting war. Uh, today, if you capture a ship, the the ship belongs to the government. The people are prisoners of the government. You don't earn anything for yourself or your, for your crew, except maybe like two weeks leave as congratulations for a good battle. So nobody today becomes rich when fighting on the seas. They may get promoted. Uh, they may earn a higher salary, but they don't make money from the enemy. So, you know, back in those days, war, whether on sea or on land, truly was a different kind of animal. War was more about uh, the personal situation and experience of fighting. Generals, of course, had their battle plans, but in the course of war, whatever you could accomplish was your own accomplishment. Uh, today, however, when soldiers do something like this, for example, Russia, when they retreated from Ukraine, they stole everything that they could take. This is now considered uh, to be a bad thing, stealing from the enemy. According to international law, this is technically illegal. And in English, the word for this is looting, uh, and it's no longer accepted. But in traditional warfare, it was a natural and normal part of war, including naval warfare. So th those are the, I think, the biggest differences. Do you have questions? OK, let's go back to the beginning of this week's reading for next before next week. Remember to read up to. Chapter 12, and that will be. The end of the first half of the book. This is page 22. On the morning appointed for Admiral and Mrs. Crofts seeing Kellynch Hall, so they come to look at the house, Anne found it most natural to take her almost daily walk to Lady Russell's and to keep out of the way till all was over. So first of all, it's not to take a walk, it's to take her walk. So almost every day she walks to Lady Russell's. This language uh, describes a walk as good for her health, right? To take her medicine is the same uh, sentence structure. Indeed, uh, in those days, even today, to go for a walk is considered exercise, good for the body, good for the mind, good for health. So to take her daily walk, almost daily walk to Lady Russell's. Uh, and she chose that particular time in order to keep out of the way. And this is to avoid maybe meeting Captain Wentworth and definitely uh, if she sees Admiral Croft, she would think of him. And she didn't want to think of Wentworth, so she found it most natural. Uh, this is kind of ironic. It's kind of joking because it's not natural at all. She chose this time. Uh, but like 
according to her situation and her attitude and her feelings, this would be the best time to take her walk. In that sense, it is very natural. When she found it most natural to be sorry that she had missed the opportunity of seeing them. But after the walk was over, she regretted her decision. She changed her mind. It turns out that she had wanted to see the crops after all. Uh, and there could be two possible reasons. One, uh, because she wanted actually to think about Wentworth. It's a kind of like a uh, cruel joy, a happy pain, that kind of romantic thing. Uh, another possibility is that from the subsequent description of what happened, it seems like it would be very entertaining. And so after she learned about what happened, she felt that she wanted to have seen it for herself. And here we get the second half of the natural joke. If she finds it most natural to walk at that time, she also finds it most natural to be sorry about this. Right? If you pretend that it is natural, then you can't complain about the bad outcome. We talked about the next Next a few paragraphs. The crops were to have possession at Michaelmas. They were supposed to move in before September 29. And as Sir Walter proposed removing to Bath in the course of the preceding months, so one month before Michaelmas, Sir Walter wanted to move to Bath. Remove here, of course, because they're not actually moving house. They're only temporarily going to Bath. Uh, in the course of the preceding month, so during the preceding month, they were going to move. Therefore, there was no time to be lost in making every dependent arrangement. So not just arranging Sir Walter and Admiral Croft, but also arranging the uh, what to do with everybody else. Dependent today is spelled with an E. Uh, so they needed to hurry to arrange everything. Lady Russell, convinced that Anne would not be allowed to be of any use or any importance in the choice of the house which they were going to secure, so she believes that nobody is going to ask Anne where they should live in Bath. To secure a house means to get a house. Therefore, she was very unwilling to have Anne hurried away so soon and wanted to make it possible for her to stay behind till she might convey her to Bath herself after Christmas. So the idea is nobody is going to value and nobody in the Elliot family is going to value Anne. So Lady Russell would rather Anne stay with her rather than have Anne hurried off to stay with people who don't care about her. Uh, to stay behind uh, for a little while, and then uh, Lady Russell would take Anne to Bath herself after Christmas. But having engagements of her own, engagements here means business, because Lady Russell had her own business, which must take her from Kellynch for several weeks, she was unable to give the full invitation she wished. Uh, so Lady Russell was not staying at Kellynch until Christmas, therefore she could not invite Anne to stay with her up to Christmas. And Anne, though dreading the possible heats of September in all the white glare of Bath, uh, white because Bath was built, a lot of Bath was built with Roman marble, Dali Shi. It was very white. So in September, it would be hot. It would be bright. Not a good place to be uh, in Bath. Not a good time to be in Bath. Uh, and grieving to forego all the influence so sweet and so sad of the autumnal months in the country. So on the one hand, she doesn't like summer in Bath. On the other hand, she would like to stay and enjoy autumn. 
at Kellynch. Uh, she calls Autumn here so sweet and sad. Therefore, she did not think that everything considered she wished to remain. Um, so after taking everything into consideration, she decided that uh, she did not uh, actually want to stay uh, at Kellynch during the autumn. Well, no, she did, but considering the entire situation, uh, she decided that she would not stay at Kellynch after all, even though she wants to. It would be most right, which here means proper, and most wise, and therefore must involve least suffering to go with the others. So notice how she thinks about this. She doesn't want to go to Bath. She wants to stay at Kellynch, but it would cause the least suffering to go to Bath with her family. Therefore, this must be the most right and the most wise choice. So as we learned last week, Anne always puts herself last. This is a good example of that. As long as everybody else is happy, uh, she will go along with everybody else. Something occurred, however, to give her a different duty. Mary, often a little unwell, and always thinking a great deal of her own complaints, to think a great deal of. Today in English, we would say to make a good deal of, to make a great deal of, which means to treat something as very important. Or in this case, to think of something as very important. To think of her own complaints as very important. And always in the habit of claiming Anne when anything was the matter, so when anything happens, she always calls for Anne to come. A uh, claim here does not mean Sensen Shensen. Claim here means, uh, I guess, Ba uh, Zan Zan Yu. Uh, so here meaning claiming Anne's time, her person. Uh, Mary, this kind of person, was indisposed. This means she's not feeling well. She is again a little unwell. And foreseeing that she should not have a day's health all the autumn, so Mary can already predict that the entire fall she would be feeling unwell. Uh, oh, this is also kind of funny because, of course, who knows how you would feel the entire autumn. Mary is using this as an excuse. Entreated, which means asked, or rather required her, her is Anne, uh, for it was hardly entreaty. You can't call what Mary is saying a request. It must have been a requirement. For Anne to come to Uppercross Cottage, uh, the small house at Uppercross, uh, at Uppercross, where Mary and Charles live, and bear her company as long as she should want her instead of going to Bath. To bear her company, to endure her uh, presence. Company is peipan. Uh, the verb is, we use the verb more commonly in English today, right? A company, peipan dongzi. The noun is company. Uh, to bear, to endure, to, to sustain. Uh, this is the polite language. Right. Oh, I'm sorry to keep you here. You must think I'm very boring. The polite language. I cannot possibly do without Anne, was Mary's reasoning. And Elizabeth's reply was, then I am sure Anne had better stay, for nobody will want her in Bath. Can you imagine your own sister saying this? Nobody wants you there. Nobody wants you to come. Oh, what a family. 
to be claimed as a good, though in an improper style, so not in a polite way, is at least better than being rejected as no good at all. And Anne, glad to be thought of some use, so to be useful, glad to have anything marked out as a duty, and certainly not sorry to have the scene of it in the country, so to be in the country, and her own dear country, somewhere she herself loves, readily agreed to stay with Mary. This invitation of Mary's removed all Lady Russell's difficulties, so she's worried about what to do with Anne. Now she doesn't have to worry. And it was consequently, which means therefore, soon settled that decided that Anne should not go to Bath till Lady Russell took her, and that all the intervening time should be divided between Uppercross Cottage and Kellynch Lodge. Kellynch Lodge is where Lady Russell lives. It's like a cottage. It's a smaller house. It's the house for guests. The Elliots live at Kellynch Hall, Da Ting. Kellynch Lodge is like Ke Wu or something like that. So the final plan is that Anne would stay with Lady Russell and then when Lady Russell had to do her business and would go to Uppercross and then after when Lady Russell came back after Christmas, she would pass by Uppercross and take Anne to Bath together. That's the plan. So far all was perfectly right, but Lady Russell was almost startled by the wrong of one part of the Kellynch Hall plan when it burst on her, which means it took her by surprise. Startled does not just mean surprise, it means shock. This was Mrs. Clay's being engaged to go to Bath with Sir Walter and Elizabeth as a most important and valuable assistant to the latter, to Elizabeth, in all the business before her. So the one part of the plan Lady Russell cannot accept is that late, uh, Mrs. Clay would go to Bath immediately with Sir Walter and Elizabeth. Why? We're going to discover this later in the next paragraph. Well, of course, we already know that Lady Russell doesn't like Mrs. Clay, but why is this such a shock? We will find out soon. By the way, what business does Elizabeth have? Well, when they go to Bath, they're not just like living in a hotel, right? They're renting a place. Uh, they will join the Society of Bath. They will have to go to parties, hold parties, take care of their rented house. There are still a lot of things to do for a lady of the house. Lady Russell was extremely sorry that such a measure should have been resorted to at all. By the way, to feel sorry does not mean sorry for yourself. It is not apology. It just means feels regret. Uh, regret today in Chinese also is translated as hokui. That's not what it means. It just means that I uh, she feels that it would this is not a good idea. It would be better to do it another way. That's simply what it means. Disapproval, I guess. That such a measure, this this uh, arrangement should have been resorted to at all. Wondered. Uh, which means can't imagine why grieved feels terrible and feared she's afraid of something. And the affront it contained to Anne. This is also insulting to Anne because Mrs. Clay is said to be of so much use, while Anne could be of no use, even though Anne is the family member. And that's why Lady Russell says that this is a measure that is resorted to, because it's, it's not, right? Anne is a good family member that can help Elizabeth. Mrs. Clay is not a family member. She's a commoner. So to choose Mrs. Clay over Anne is a great insult. 
and to Mrs. Russell is a very sore aggravation. An aggravation is something that makes her feel very frustrated. Sore uh, today means tantong. Here it means it's something that she continually feels uh, negative about. So not just when she learns about it, but in the future, every time she remembers, uh, she feels feels very frustrated at this situation. Anne herself has become hardened to such affronts. So her family has insulted her so many times she doesn't really care anymore. To be hardened to, she no longer feels so deeply this insult. But she felt the imprudence of the arrangement quite as keenly as Lady Russell. Imprudence here means uh, but not in the manner of being polite, not in manner of etiquette. Imprudent means practically speaking is not a good idea. Why? With a great deal of quiet observation, and a knowledge which she often wished less of her father's character. So because she knows her father's character, but she often wished that she did not understand her father so well. Because her father's character is not very good. So with observation and knowledge, she was sensible. She was aware that results the most serious to his family from the intimacy were more than possible. The intimacy between Mrs. Clay and Elizabeth. So the fact that Mrs. Clay is on such good and close terms with the Elliot family might have serious results, and this is more than possible. What results? She did not imagine that her father had at present an idea of the kind. She don't she doesn't think her father is aware of this danger. Mrs. Clay had freckles, triban, and a projecting tooth, uh, and a clumsy wrist, which he was constantly, he was continually making severe remarks upon in her absence. So whenever Mrs. Clay is not here, uh, Sir Walter always uh, says negative things about. Uh, these aspects of Mrs. Clay. But she was young and certainly altogether well looking. Ah, so we start to see the danger. Not between Mrs. Clay and Elizabeth, but between Mrs. Clay and Sir Walter. Both of them are single, right? Lady Elliot had died. Mr. Clay had died. And this would be terrible if they got married because Mrs. Clay is a commoner. Um, you know, so like why would this be possible, right? The first evidence that Anne uh, thinks about is how Mrs. Clay is not, uh, how Sir Walter keeps on saying negative things about Mrs. Clay behind her back. On the other hand, though, she was young and altogether well looking altogether means generally so not like in these details but generally and she possessed in an acute mind a sharp mind a quick mind and assiduous pleasing manners so she's very careful to always be pleasing we talked about this last week because she has these two aspects, she's infinitely more dangerous than any merely personal, again, meaning of the body, might have been. So even though she's not the most beautiful woman, she's not exactly ugly. And on the other hand, uh, her mind is very pleasing. She tries her best to please Sir Walter, and therefore this is much more dangerous than the other way around if she simply were beautiful but was stupid. It's much more likely that she might finagle a marriage with Sir Walter using her mind than simply with her body. Especially because we know that Sir Walter cares about status. 
if it were a beautiful commoner, he uh, probably is unlikely to change his mind about her status. But if she could use her mind uh, and her her intellect to change Sir Walter's mind, it's more possible they might get married. And this would be a disaster for the Elliot family. Anne was so impressed by the, de the degree of their danger. So to be impressed by means she feels it very strongly. That she could not excuse herself from trying to make it perceptible to her sister. So she's trying to make Elizabeth aware of the danger. She could find no excuse not to do this. She had little hope of success, but Elizabeth, who in the event of such a reverse, a, a bad end, bad result, would be so much more to be pitied than herself. Why? Because if Sir Walter marries Mrs. Clay, Elizabeth would no longer be the lady of the house. The lady of the house would be Mrs. Clay, who would then become the second Lady Elliot. So Elizabeth would uh, feel the reverse, the bad effect of this danger much more th than anyone else. It would be so much more to be pitied because of this result. Uh, but Elizabeth would never, she thought, have reason to reproach her for giving no warning. Reproach means blame. So the idea is, even if Elizabeth doesn't listen to me, at least if it does happen, she can't blame me for not trying to warn her. Anne spoke and seemed only to offend. Elizabeth could not conceive, could not imagine how such an absurd suspicion could occur to her. Right, this crazy idea. And indignantly, uh, uh, so angry with good reason. Uh, from her perspective, she has a good reason. Answered for each party's perfectly knowing their situation. So she says everybody knows exactly what's going on. Nobody is going to try anything sneaky like that. Mrs. Clay, Elizabeth said warmly. OK, warmly today, if you use the word warmly to describe somebody talking, it means that they speak with Warmth and Wenshindi But here it means uh, with some temper, you would Not angry, like full out angry. Uh, if Elizabeth were angry, this would be said she hotly. Uh, but here it's not that angry, so it's just warm, not hot. Said she, she said, same thing. Mrs. Clay never forgets who she is. And as I am rather better acquainted with her sentiments, her feelings, than you can be, so I know her feelings better than you, I can assure you that upon the subject of marriage, they are particularly nice. Nice here does not mean good. Nice means careful and discriminating. You attribute uh, so her feelings about marriage are very discriminating. What does this mean? The next sentence. She reprobates, disapproves of all inequality of condition and rank more strongly than most people. So she cares that the two people who marry must match each other. And that's what this means. Sentiments about marriage are nice. Uh, rank, piming here means the status of importance. Uh, but think about this. 
How would Elizabeth know? Well, because Mrs. Clay tells her, but why should we believe Mrs. Clay? If Mrs. Clay marries Sir Walter, it would be entirely to her, Mrs. Clay's advantage. So why should we believe her when she says that she would never do this? It seems like Elizabeth uh, is in the palm of Mrs. Clay's hands. Elizabeth continues, and as to my father, I really should not have thought that he, who has kept himself single so long for our sakes with a woman, need be suspected now. Why would you suspect him now when he has kept himself single for our sakes for so long? But of course, we learned from chapter one, all the way back in chapter one, that Sir Walter did try to remarry twice but was rejected. And because he could not find someone worthy enough to marry, he changed the way that he described his situation. And only then did he start saying that he remained single for his children. Apparently, Elizabeth believed him. Uh, from these two pieces of evidence, we can say that Elizabeth is a fool. Elizabeth continues, if Mrs. Clay were a very beautiful woman, I grant you, it might be wrong to have her so much with me. Not that anything in the world, I am sure, would induce Tzu Chen, my father, to make a degrading match, a match to someone who is lower than him. But he might be rendered unhappy. The idea is, if Mrs. Clay were beautiful, Sir Walter probably still would not marry her, but he would be unhappy that he uh, does not marry her. He would want to marry her, but he would feel like due to manners and politeness, he can't really go through with the marriage, so he would be unhappy. But poor Mrs. Clay, who with all her merits, Yodian, uh, not sure what those merits are, can never have been reckoned tolerably pretty. So not even tolerably pretty. So tolerably kerongrendi. So not like average pretty, not pretty at all. I really think poor Mrs. Clay may be staying here in perfect safety. Uh, now Anne replies, there is hardly any personal defect which an agreeable manner might not gradually reconcile one to. The idea is if someone has an agreeable manner, behavior, and attitude, this might help other people to accept any personal defect of the body. To reconcile means to accept, or over time to not refuse, not reject. But to this idea, Elizabeth says, I think very differently. An agreeable manner may set off handsome features, so it may emphasize handsome features, but can never alter plain ones. Uh, so being agreeable, so to Anne, being agreeable is more important, but to Elizabeth, being beautiful is more important. Uh, and then Elizabeth says, as I have a great deal more at stake on this point than anybody else, I think it rather unnecessary to be advising me. The idea is, if they did get married, I would suffer the most, and I know this, so you don't have to tell me. God, how rude. Before I let you go, I want to talk about one thing that I forgot from the last hour which is that um, where is it there is a place where mary is called mr charles sorry mrs charles um mrs charles refers to mary 
We said last time when a man and a woman get married at that time, the woman takes the man's name. They're called Mr. and Mrs. Charles Musgrove. Uh, so her name could be Mrs. Musgrove, Mrs. Charles, or Mary. All three refer to the same person. OK, do you have questions? No. OK, thank you. So before next week, please finish reading up to chapter 12. See you next week. Um, do I have signing today? Uh, no, as long as you join the meeting, you will be part of the attendance record. OK, thank you. See you next week. OK, see you guys next week. Bye.